from MTN News. This is Face the State. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on Face the State. I'm Augusta McDonald. The 68th legislative session is coming to a fiery close with just a week left before signee die. For the remainder of the session, when the Montana House gathers on the floor, Missoula Democrat Representative Zoe Zephyr's seat will be empty. After a vote without any historical precedent, the state's first and only elected transgender politician is banned. She'll be allowed to vote on bills remotely, but will not be permitted to speak or enter the House floor gallery or ante room. One day after being banned, Representative Zephyr made this bench right outside the House chambers her office for the day. A sticky note reading C31 was placed on the wall above her. Zephyr isn't allowed to enter the chambers after Republicans disciplined her for actions during a protest that spilled into the gallery Monday. The House gallery is expected to be closed for the remainder of the session to all visitors. So first, let's go over exactly how the legislature reached this historic moment. Last week, lawmakers were considering a bill to block gender-affirming care for trans kids. Representative Zephyr believes passing that legislation will contribute to risk of suicidality and self-harm among transgender youth. She said that this. I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. House Speaker Matt Regeer said this comment broke the rules of decorum. He decided he would not be recognizing Representative Zephyr until she apologized. Zephyr refuses to say sorry to this day. So during the next floor session, when she requested to speak, Regeer, as promised, refused to call on her. Now let's fast forward to Monday. Zephyr's supporters gathered at the Capitol protesting Regeer's decision. They filed into the gallery. Zephyr tried to weigh in on a bill. Speaker Regeer again refused to call on her, and then this happened. Let her speak! Let her speak! Let her speak! Notice Representative Zephyr here holding up her mic in this moment as the crowd chants. Republicans say it's one of the deciding factors in their decision to discipline her, saying she encouraged the protest. Seven people were arrested during this protest, and it led House leadership to cancel Tuesday's session. That brings us up to what happened on Wednesday. Republicans in the Montana House voting to ban Zephyr, citing her actions during the protest, as we mentioned earlier, holding her mic up. Zephyr, who was allowed to speak while lawmakers considered banning her, explained why she did that. And why I raised my microphone to amplify their voices, to make sure that the people who elected me here are heard. And that when this body seeks to pass bills that harm our community, that get us killed, that this body is held accountable. It takes two-thirds majority vote to discipline someone. Even with every Democrat a staunch no, Republicans had the votes. Zephyr's disciplinary consequences are exceptional in Montana, but discipline like this hasn't been seen in Montana since the late 1800s, as former MTN political reporter Mike Dennison explained to me. I've seen many instances where someone has not recognized on the floor or where the, the chair of the body refuses to recognize someone for various reasons. And it might be mad at what they're saying. You know, this, this happens on occasion. This situation, though, is a little different. Now Democrats say disciplining Representative Zephyr for her blood on your hands comment is peak hypocrisy. You'll remember a couple legislators even left a debate last month when a Republican lawmaker said this about abortion. In California, um, Satanists have stated that it's a religious right to abort their children. I'm Senate, going to recommend Senate. that the minority not participate in the remainder of this discussion if we are going to Satanism. Thank you. Republicans counter by saying it wasn't just Zephyr's comments that got her banned, but actions during Monday's protest. So we need to ask the question, what happens next? I spoke with ACLU attorneys who are watching this entire situation very closely. They tell me legal action is a possibility. And those constitutions contain explicit protections for free speech that extend to legislative debate, uh, even when that debate involves unpopular perspectives. There is legal recourse available under United States Supreme Court precedent to ask a judge to overrule the actions undertaken by Montana House and ensure that she is allowed to speak in an unfettered manner and or be reinstated in her seat. It's unknown if any legal action will be pursued, but we do know there is still a significant amount of policy work left to be done. After the break, Governor Greg Gianforte signs updated block management incentives for private landowners. Stay with us. Follow MTN's coverage of the 68th session online anytime at your local MTN website.
Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back to Face the State. In 2021, the Montana legislature approved a higher cap for payments made to block management area cooperators. And as of Tuesday, that cap has been doubled. MTN's Sam Hoyle was at the bill signing. Hunters and landowners, you're probably going to want to listen up. Senate Bill 58 was just signed into law by Governor Greg Gianforte. The bill effectively doubles the cap for compensation for landowners who open up their land under a block management agreement. It's really an exciting day for Montana. Uh, today we're investing in the success of our block management program. The bill brought by Republican Senator Steve Heimbaugh of Weibo received support from both sides of the aisle in both chambers of the Montana legislature. According to Fish, Wildlife and Parks, there are a plethora of block management areas scattered around Montana where private landowners open their gates to public hunting. But according to FWP, some BMAs see more use than others, and this law will help compensate those landowners for their willingness to be, in the governor's words, neighbors helping neighbors. The $50,000 cap increases it so that landowners aren't, they're being appropriately compensated for the impacts and access that they provide. With the old cap, we were having some landowners have hundreds and thousands of hunter days that they weren't being compensated for. And that's a lot of impact. So that's one of the reasons this bill is really important. According to Yoshioka, approximately 20 of the BMA cooperators were reaching the cap of $25,000 set by the 2021 legislature and says this bill will hopefully accommodate all of them. The law became effective immediately after the governor signed it. In Helena, Sam Hoyle, MTN News. Two bills surrounding charter schools and school choice have new life. These proposals were voted down this week, but as MTN's Jonathan Ambarian reports, lawmakers decided to reconsider their actions. House Bills 549 and 562 passed the House together last month and through Senate committees together over the last week. On Wednesday, the two charter school bills were stalled in the Senate, but they're both active once again and set for votes in the Senate on Friday. First on the agenda Wednesday was House Bill 562 to create community choice schools, operating largely independent from the existing public school system and with exemptions from a number of requirements for those schools. Supporters of that bill said it was the best vehicle to provide real choice for students not served well by existing schools. Public school can handle the competition if, there, if this is competitive and it is cost effective. Please vote yes and give students in Montana an opportunity and their parents an opportunity to have some real choices. But opponents had questions about the impact it would have on existing schools. Just in the back of my mind, I feel like there needs to be a little more work done on this to not affect the rest of the schools that uh, we obviously need for our, our kids. HB 562 failed narrowly on a 23-27 vote. The Senate then took up HB 549, which would give local school boards the first chance to set up a charter if parents request one. If they decline or are unable to, other groups would be able to come in. These schools would have fewer exemptions from existing laws. This is a perfect example of how students will have a choice. They want to study something. They want to go somewhere where they can utilize and build their skills. This is an opportunity if they can't get it through their local public school. But opponents said the bill didn't create a significant enough change. This isn't needed. Schools can already do many things that are here. So I just encourage you to vote no on this and let's move on. 549 was voted down 8 to 42. But on Thursday, the Senate voted to reconsider their action on both bills. Supporters of each proposal said they'd talked and they wanted to get more information about the policy out to senators. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Thank you, Jonathan. And after this, we have more on the week ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back to Face the State. In the last two weeks, tensions boiled over at the legislature, leaving a lot of work still left to be done, including the $14 billion budget bill that needs to be signed by the end of next week. Let's listen in on what House Majority and Minority Party leadership have to say about the challenges ahead. House Speaker Matt Regeer joining us now, and we are going to talk about some of the big, big items left to get done before we get to the end of the session this week. Uh, Speaker Regeer, thanks for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, first, um, the topic on everybody's minds, the past couple weeks, um, a lot of coverage and discussion about the disciplinary actions against Representative Zoe Zephyr. Um, talk a little bit about 
um, you know, floor session was closed Tuesday. Um, a lot of energy has gone into uh, resolving um, the situation. Um, where does that where does that leave all of the work that's uh, remaining to be done before Friday? Yeah, and it's, it was an unfortunate week here for Montana. It's an unfortunate week for the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, on Monday, we did have uh, even police and riot gear had to clear out the galleries, um, which is sad. And it did, it did, it stopped work. Um, stopped work. Uh, we're concerned about safety. Uh, the next day there on Tuesday, and um, and then Wednesday uh, was a short day too, just with that uh, constitutional motion. Uh, to protect the house. So we lost some days of work there. Um, we're working extra along here on Thursday. We've got a deadline here again on Friday to get some amended bills back over to the Senate. So we don't want any bills to time out. A lot of good ideas out there, uh, a lot of good ideas in these bills, and we don't want them to get timed out. So uh, spend an extra long day here on Thursday. Uh, um, so I, th I think we'll make all the deadlines and, and still have it going, but we're going to have to work some long hours. And I'm curious um, what sort of feedback you've gotten from, you know, your constituents or just members of the community about um, the disciplinary action against Representative Zephyr. Um, I get, what are you hearing from people? Sure. I think as far as Montana, I think a lot of Montanans uh, are tired of, and myself included, we're tired of the high temperature. Uh, we can have differences of opinion and even differences on uh, deeply personal things. Every issue is deeply personal uh, to a, to a lot of different Montanans. I mean, we're we're a vast state and a diverse state. Um, so I, I think that there is there has been at least for me there's been uh, a lot of support from people that realize that that we need civil debate and we don't need police and riot gear having to clear out uh, our gallery and. Uh, and so there's been good support for that. There has been, which is surprising. I knew that we we're a pol polarized country, but um, there has been hit pieces going out across the nation. And there is there's just a lot of hate out there. And that hate, I think, needs to be uh, turned down. We need to get back to a civil discourse of uh, we can even disagree uh, with each other, but but keep that conversation going. That's how you come to a conclusion at the end. And so let's transition a little bit into some of the work remaining to be done in the next uh, you know, several days. Um, let's talk a little bit about HB2. When can folks expect to see that back on the House floor? Yeah, so that is, I believe, on third reading in the Senate today, and will come back to us beginning of next week. Um, and that, yeah, that's one big thing we've got here to finish up. That's our one constitutional duty uh, to pass is a, is a balanced budget. Uh, right now, uh, I think it's, uh, it's fairly good. Um, the Senate has made some amendments. The House, I think, is going to put our fingerprints on it once again. Um, but hopefully we can put a bow on that uh, maybe Wednesday or Thursday of next week. And, uh, and that would be a big piece of, of work that would be off our, off our plate. And are you planning to, if, if the Senate sends it back with amendments, what are your next steps? Are you expecting um, conference committees? Um, you know, right now, conference committee is probably 50-50. Um, they did amend it, so it'd be something we'd have to concur on and just send it to the governor. Or it'd be something that uh, if there's enough angst here in the House and we don't have the votes, then we would have to send it to a conference committee. And that probably depends a lot on uh, this unprecedented surplus that Montana has. And this one time only spending, there's a lot of bills, a lot of legislators had great ideas on how to spend that OTO money. And they're still floating out there. So it'll depend on, I think, which which kind of fraction or, or group uh, pushing which idea um, has their uh, budget surplus one time only spending bills cross the finish line as to what's going to happen with House Bill 2. And what is your level of confidence about this work um, getting done in a, in a way that, um, uh, you know, kind of makes sense and um, kind of res res respects all the work that has gone into these bills all session in terms of the time frame that you have now? Um, the time we're speaking, we've got about six days. Yeah, and it's a, I mean, our Constitution only gives us 90 days to get all this work done. And so it's nothing new. This happens every session of uh, there's negotiations and it's uh, always this pressure down here at the end. And there'll be a lot of pressure, but pressure makes diamonds. And I think we're going to come out with some good diamonds here in the next uh, six or seven days. I'm very optimistic. Minority Leader in the House, Kim Abbott, thank you so much for joining me for Face the State. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. 
It's good to see you. Um, okay, so first let's touch. Uh, let's touch on. Uh, there was a lot of action in the House this week. Some uh, some kind of new territory for um, the legislature in terms of Representative Zoe Zephyr being um, banned from the floor. We've had a day to think about it. Um, where are you at? So nothing's changed um, for for our caucus. You know, um, Representative Zephyr um, is duly elected member of the house she should be able to freely debate bills on the floor she should be able to fully represent her constituents this is an unprecedented action by the speaker uh, to remove um, a sitting representative from the floor for the remainder of the session um, she's voting remote remotely from like the the hallway outside the chamber um, I said yesterday on the floor and I believe it to be true like um, there were there were other avenues um, to discipline Representative Zephyr. If the speaker thought that was what was necessary for order and decorum, um, she could have been called to order. Like the, the fact that he just refused to recognize her um, for a week and then um, removed her for um, admittance privileges is, um, it's just unprecedented. Um, and I think you heard Representative Wendy Boy on the floor yesterday go through some of the things that he has seen over his 20 years um, serving in the legislature. Um, that didn't result in this kind of punishment. Um, you know, I also said that the Constitution allows them to do this, um, but it is absolutely the wrong choice. Um, they they could have done things a lot of different ways, and instead, uh, what we have is the disenfranchisement of the eleven thousand Montanans, um, with representatives that for not being able uh, to fully engage on the floor. What do you think the I guess the recourse for what's going on is um, um, if there's if there's a sense that something like a wrong was done here, what are the steps that either the Democratic Party can take or the minority in, uh, party in the House? Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what does this mean moving forward even after this legislative session is over? Yeah, like we've set a precedent here that's alarming for sure. And I think that, um, you know, what the Democratic Party is doing, um, you know, I think you can, that's a question for the Democratic Party. Um, I know that people are engaging, you know, some legal advice and some analysis. Um, and, you know, for our part, our caucus is balancing, you know, defending these like first principles of representative democracy um, and the Constitution and remembering that we are still at work here. Um, we are moving legislation. We only have 32 members in the House, but we have a number of our key priorities still alive and moving through the process. So it's a balancing act for us to make sure that we are still working to deliver for our constituents, still working on childcare and affordable housing and provider rates um, that help with our mental health infrastructure and still trying to find a vehicle for targeted property tax relief down the stretch here. Um, that's our job, but we cannot ignore um, the extreme nature of what's happening to Representative Zephyr. And so we need to be defending, you know, the core democratic principles of free speech and democratic representation. An issue uh, close to the heart of your caucus is uh, funding some sort of child care solution for families. Um, talk about um, the work that's being done right now to get that across the finish line. Yeah, so I think we came into the session hearing from families, communities, businesses that we have to address child care. Um, the COVID um, pandemic really, really injured like the infrastructure for, for child care. Um, and we needed to start to correct that. So we have um, Representative Alice Buckley from Bozeman has brought a bill that would expand um, the child care program called Best Beginnings. It's a scholarship program and it does three things. It um, increases the eligibility um, back to where it was at COVID levels. We actually had an, an unintentional cut to eligibility because January 1st, the COVID levels um, reverted back. Um, so it fixes that. Um, it's, it helps stabilize um, businesses by dealing with the way that they're reimbursed. Um, there was some volatility and uncertainty, and it made it really hard for these small businesses um, that are providing childcare to stay afloat and predict their, um, their revenue streams. It fixes that. And the third thing that it does is it takes care of copays. Copays were set up in a way that really disincentivized um, 
adding hours for for parents. Um, it you you just paid a stiff penalty if you started to make more money um, in a way that didn't make any rational sense and actually disincentivized work. And so that was something that Republicans and Democrats could really agree on. You know, like we need to fix that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so that has bipartisan support that passed on second reading um, today in the Senate. Um, it wasn't amended. So if it passes on third reading, we expect it to um, transmit back to the speaker for his signature um, and then hopefully onto the governor. So we just need to get it through third, but it will be a really important, um, a really important step in addressing um, our childcare needs. And, you know, you saw a diverse group of, group of people um, supporting that from childcare providers, parents, um, small and large businesses and communities across the state. So it'll be an exciting win if we can um, if we can get that to the governor's desk. Welcome back to Face the State. And welcome back to Face the State. Joining us now, MGN senior political reporter, Jonathan Ambarian. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Augusta. And it's been a very busy week and uh, another busy week is coming your way. Uh, HB2, the big budget bill not signed yet is expected early next week. Um, where are things at with, with that measure? Well, I think the first thing to make clear is that next week is going to be the last week of the legislature. They absolutely cannot go any longer than the end of next week. They have 90, 90 legislative days to do their work and uh, day 90 right now is looking like it's going to be Friday, uh, May 5th. Fifth. So, uh, yeah, we don't know exactly what day of the week the, the session may end, but it is going to end next week. Um, as far as the budget bill, that's the one thing they have to get passed um, in order for the session to wrap up. And yeah, so this week it, it went through the Senate. Uh, they added a few more million dollars here and there, um, uh, added some more money for provider rates, which is a big thing that's been talked about all session. They made a couple of other changes. And so the bill now has to go back to the House and the House has to decide whether or not they're going to accept the Senate's amendments. If they accept the Senate's amendments, then the bill is on its way to the governor's desk to be signed. And if they reject the amendments, then it has to go to a conference committee where uh, some members from the House and some members from the Senate try and hammer out the differences between the two versions and obviously if they go to a conference committee it's going to take a lot longer and that'll extend us uh, probably right towards the end of the week if they need to do that so that'll have a big uh, impact on how the rest of the week shakes out and what are other what are some of the other kind of outstanding measures that um the remaining priorities that um, both houses are trying to push forward well, one of the things that uh, gets set up at the Capitol around the end of the session every year is that nothing is truly dead until signee die, which signee die is the phrase that they use to mean the last day of the session when they adjourn and don't set another time for coming back. And so uh, what, what you see in the last week is a lot of times there are bills that are they're stalled temporarily, but then they come back or they come back in some different form. So there's always a little bit of surprise in the last week, but I think it's pretty clear that that there'll be some discussion about some of the things they're trying to do some last minute uh, effort on housing bills, uh, on uh, pension related bills. Um, presumably, we may uh, find out for sure what they want to do on something like uh, charter schools, for example, those are still sort of in the uh, in the air a little bit and so yeah i mean those are some of the things that that we'll watch and and you never know some of the things that we've talked a lot about uh they they, they may be stalled they may be tabled they may come back at some point they may get amended into a different bill at the last minute those are the kind of things that we can't really predict what might happen the last week there have been some things that really changed just even on the last day okay all right thanks so much thank you